Okay, so before I begin this video, I'm gonna have to preface this by saying that my voice, I may lose my voice or my voice may crack. Uh, it's deeper than usual. Uh, the reason is because I'm down with a little bit of a sore throat. Uh, I don't think it's COVID. I did a test, a self-test earlier and it's fine. I don't have a fever, but um, I'll be coughing a little bit and I'll be sniffling throughout the video. Um, so uh, I hope it does not make uh, you uncomfortable and I hope the video will go by quite smoothly. And I would also like to thank you guys for your l kindness and support uh, to my previous videos. I think it's amazing and it just gives me the drive and the motivation to keep going. All right, so without further ado, we want to explain how enzymes work in this particular video. And in the previous video, I did say that enzymes are able to bind to the substrate and they are able to lower something known as the activation energy. In this video, we're going to see how the enzymes actually lower the activation energy uh, when it's uh, in, in an attempt to try to make the reaction easier to happen. So this is my own example. You don't have to memorize this example, all right? But in my example over here, I'm drawing out a disaccharide. And the disaccharide molecule is linked together by two monosaccharides represented by the two oval-shaped structures and the chemical bond known as the glycosidic bond in the middle. Now, for example, if I want to break this glycosidic bond, by hydrolysis, I will need to add water. Now, just to revise back, like the previous video, if I have water at 30 degrees Celsius hit the glycosidic bond, will it be able to break the bond? No. You see, you're able, you, you have water, but the water is not able to collide with the glycosidic bond effectively because the water doesn't have much of a kinetic energy. So, the glycosidic bond will not be broken even though water was present. Now, say I were to actually heat the water up to 100 degrees Celsius and the kinetic energy of the water is so high, it's able to hit the glycosidic bond at such a high energy level and an effective collision takes place. And what happens to the glycosidic bond? The glycosidic bond has been broken. So this is when hydrolysis is effective using water. So if we were to just basically draw out an energy level graph, remember, because hydrolysis is an exothermic reaction where the substrate or the reactant will have a higher energy level, the products will have a lower energy level. You don't have to memorize this for biology, that's more for chemistry level knowledge. But it's good to understand that at least, okay? So the red lines that I'm drawing over there represent their energy levels. But to convert the substrate to a product, you had to heat up the water to, for example, a 100 degrees Celsius so that an effective collision would have taken place, right? And that extra heat you have to give is known as the activation energy. I've told you all before in the previous video that activation energy is just basically the energy required for a chemical reaction to take place or an energy required to convert a substrate to a product. <coughs> oh God, sorry. Okay. Um, now, uh, with the help of an enzyme, however, um, I'm drawing out a two-dimensional version. Now, enzymes are actually globular proteins. They're supposed to be three-dimensional. And I always love to represent my enzyme as a Pac-Man, right? as just a reverse Pac-Man. If you know what Pac-Man is, uh, good. If you don't know what Pac-Man is, I think I'm officially old. There are moments where I, I will be teaching my students and I'll say, oh, this looks like Pac-Man. And they'll go, what is Pac-Man? Or who is Pac-Man? And I just think to myself, oh God, bury me. Just kill me now. All right, or put me in a museum somewhere. Anyway, so the enzymes actually have uh, this weird little shape where it folds inwards known as the active site. The active site is just basically the part of the enzyme that is able to bind to a substrate. In this case, the substrate being the disaccharide at the top left. Now, it is very important if we zoom into the active site, remember enzymes are actually just proteins and proteins are just basically made up of amino acids. Each of those green circles represent an amino acid and I'm also drawing out their R groups, all right? 
Now, what is very important is the enzyme must be able to bind to the substrate. And for the enzyme to be able to bind to the substrate, the active side of the enzyme has to be complementary to the substrate. A common mistake students love to make in the exam is they love to say the enzyme's active site has the same shape to the substrate. It's not the same shape. The shape is complementary. If you say the shape of the enzyme and substrates are the same, it's wrong. The shape is matching or complementary. That's a very important keyword to understand. Now, when the active site of the enzyme is able to fit with the substrate at the glycosidic bond, the R groups where I'm highlighting over here will not break the glycosidic bond. It does not break the glycosidic bond, but for the lack of a better word, the R groups disturb the glycosidic bond. It kind of just annoys the I, I, I don't like using that. Uh, it annoys the glycosidic bond. It interacts with the glycosidic bond to make it weaker. And when it makes the glycosidic bond weaker, water at 37 degrees Celsius will be able to break the glycosidic bond. You don't have to heat the water up to 100 degrees Celsius anymore because the R groups of the enzyme's active site were able to interact with the bond and weaken it. Therefore, in this situation over here, with the help of an enzyme, do you actually need to heat the water up to 100 degrees Celsius? No. For the human body, the water can be at 37 degrees Celsius, which is coincidentally our core body temperature. So the water is able to break the glycosidic bond at 37 degrees Celsius. So what happens to the activation energy? The activation energy in this case has been reduced by the enzymes. That's what enzymes actually do, fundamentally. Enzymes just make it easier for the reaction to happen by reducing the activation energy. And how does it reduce the activation energy? It reduces the activation energy by its active site binding to the substrate and weakening the bonds within the substrate. That's basically it. Now, just to summarize this back again, I'm just drawing out an amylose molecule or starch at the top. You can see many alpha glucose linked together by glycosidic bonds. And it's very important for an enzyme to be able to bind the substrate. I'm drawing out the primary structure of a polypeptide over there, just a sing, uh, sequence of uh, amino acids. And what actually happens is that sequence of amino acid folds to become a secondary structure. You can see the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. And they fold further to form a tertiary structure. If you need a revision on this, I'm going to put a link uh, in the description box. So you can go back and revise your primary, secondary, tertiary structure. And when it forms the tertiary structure, you can kind of see that Pac-Man kind of appearance, okay? This is just, again, my way of uh, teaching enzymes. Do enzymes all have Pac-Man shapes? No, of course not. They don't have that kind of like a quarter-eaten pizza slice shape with an open mouth. Uh, I just love uh, representing enzymes like that. That's just my way of doing it. But the point of the matter here is the enzymes are just basically made up of polypeptide chains. And in this case here, the enzyme has a tertiary structure. And I'm just highlighting that area. That area is basically known as the active site, where I'm going to put the amino acids with their R groups uh, represented in green. And it's the same R groups that I'm drawing on the right side, just to show you how it looks like on a simplified version. And it's just very important for the active side of the enzyme to be able to bind to the substrate. They are able to bind to the substrate because the active side of the enzyme is not the same shape, but complementary or matching to the substrate. The R groups in the enzyme's active side are then able to form a temporary interaction with the substrate. It's temporary, it's not permanent here. Yeah? The enzyme will eventually have to detach from the substrate because it, if it permanently binds to the substrate, then it's useless and it <coughs> weakens the glycosidic bonds, which makes it easier for hydrolysis to take place. Now, uh, when I teach this, a few students will make the observation, do enzymes only help with hydrolysis? Don't they do other things as well? If you notice my previous video, I did say that enzymes do not just do hydrolysis. Different types of enzymes will, ca will catalyze different types of chemical reactions. I just like talking about hydrolysis because it, it is one of the easier chemical reactions to represent. 
Now, as we can see here, what happens is, once the hydrolysis takes place, the enzyme's job is far from over. What does the enzyme do? The enzyme just moves on to the next glycosidic bond. So that same enzyme can be reused over and over and over again, so that um, it can break multiple glycosidic bonds. That is the definition of a catalyst, isn't it? Because enzymes are just these things that makes the reaction easier by reducing its activation energy. They will not be used up and they can be reused over and over again. That's basically it.